to start talking about uh, EVN calibration basics uh, for you all. And Benita, I'll give you a, a five minute warning before the end. So whenever you're ready, please take it away. You're still muted. I know, yeah, <laughs> you know, thanks, Andy. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone to the second day. Um, this talk will be kind of the opposite compared to yesterday's. So here we will focus on the basics, on the concepts that you apply during a data reaction. So actually in this talk, I will not focus too much in detail about how you apply things or you conduct any calibration steps in CASA or in any other packages. But they will be more focused on the concepts to understand what you are doing and why you are doing that. Uh, of course, this is just a 45 minute talk and we'll go through the basic even calibration. So I'm not also going to focus on the technical or mathematical details. You have a reference for that but my purpose is to just explain the basic concepts and make all of them clear and easily to understand why you are applying that or why you need those ones so this talk i will try to cover basically all the levels that you may have so for some of you that are already uh, trained and experts on vlbi it may be a bit simple for most of the part of the talk, but for all of you may find interesting even from the beginning. So please reach your level through the talk. Um, as you may know, you have um, you already saw from the lecture yesterday, we have different calibration steps to conduct in VLBI data. Uh, this is a list of the common ones that should be applied in IBM data sets, for example, like from the paradigmatic angle correction that was mentioned yesterday yesterday and it's simple ones. Some of the calibrations are exactly in the same, not only for VLBI, but almost for any re radio data analysis, like the bandpass calibration, and of course, cleaning and self-calibration. And there are some of them that are really particular for a VLBI, like the priori gain calibration, so how we apply the system temperatures, as you had a discussion yesterday and also in the chats, and the fringe feed. Um, in this talk, I'm not going to focus in really details about the basics of each of these ones. I will explain why and the concept of them, but then you are going to have different um, focused lectures on each of these steps. So again, I'm not going to discuss the really fundamentals of radio interferometers or radio analysis. Uh, I'm just showing the concepts to the to be able to understand them, but of course. Of course, we will need to, or it's helpful to start with a few slides from the very beginning to understand. If someone is interested on the really details and fundamentals of those ones, you may find this book that is actually freely available to download. So everyone can watch it, and it's a good reference textbook for radio analysis. So again, here we are playing with interferometers, which means that we are combining the signal from the at least pair of uh, antennas. And of course, we want that because we can reach a higher resolution. If we combine coherently the data from two different radio antennas, then the resolution that we can achieve is inversely proportional to the separation of these two antennas, which means that, for example, for antennas that are separating of the order of 1,000 kilometers, we can already reach resolutions of the order of the milliard second at gigahertz frequencies. Okay, so that's a fundamental basic so purposes of VLBI interferometers. Uh, here in house we have the AVN, which is currently the largest VLBI network in the world, and also the most sensitive at gigahertz frequencies. And basically we are combining a, a inform, well, yeah, data from antennas that are basically in Europe, Asia, South Africa, Central America. So again, if we really want to combine the data coherently from each pair of antennas here, we really need to trace and 
make a geometrical model on where they are placed and what we are observing. Uh, basically, each of the antennas will receive the signal from a source in the sky, and then we really want to combine coherently. So that means that we are combining the same wavefront at the same particular time. That means that we need to take into account the geometrical delays. Here you see the wavefront coming from the source. So you need to take and re uh, remove the geometrical delays that you may have in the signal as it arrives to one on another station. And this, of course, involves uh, knowing with high precision, at least to the precision proportional to the wave length that you are measuring, the station, the absolute station position relative between them and the source position in the sky. But also you really need to keep track of the times, of the arrival times of the signal to each station, because otherwise you cannot uh, combine those ones. But of course, all these stations are in the earth and you have a vast number of different small movements that you need to incorporate when you are combining these ones. So this is basically a fundamental model that is considered at the correlator level, which is where you combine the data from these two stations. And then you do it for each pair of antennas in your array. So actually the correlator only does a, basically a geometrical model and accounts for that. You will receive the two signals from the two stations and basically you are just correcting for that geometrical difference between those ones. And of course here everything is relative to basically one of the stations so you don't keep track of the absolute times you just want the relative differences between one and the other. So from the signal that you receive uh, from the telescopes basically you are stored the visibilities that are complex numbers per baseline, so uh, antennas I and J, and you have uh, the information about the phase and the amplitude there. Uh, as it is for base, uh, per baseline based, uh, you typically consider the baseline vectors, which is basically the different position between the two antennas, and you use a convenient system of reference, which is U, B, and W, which means, where, well, it's set as W pointing to the direction of the shores, and U is the axis between east and west, and V is the axis north and south. So that means that from the point of view of the shores, you only play with two, or mostly you only play with two units, U and V, which is the UV plane that you've already uh, seen in previous lectures. And this is basically how that baseline, so the separation between the two stars, is seen from the source. But of course, these complex numbers is basically a, the signal that you are recording from the sky. So at the end, what you want to measure, or what you are measuring, is the sky intensity and that particular uh, field in the sky. And then you are doing basically a Fourier transform there. And this is what you are storing, the visibility is there. <coughs> but of course, the signal that you are recording from the telescopes is not just the Fourier transform of the real intensity of the sky. So assuming that given a intensity fun a, yeah, function in the sky, you will expect some given visibilities per baseline. However, we have a lot of effects that comes into account and affects that data. So what we are actually recording, the, visibility, the observed visibilities, it, they are proportional to what you expect from the sky, but you have a lot of effects that alter that signal. So coming from the right to the left, of course, the signal that you are getting is affected by opacity and path length variations uh, from the atmosphere. So that means that you have a perturbation in the real signal you will expect. Of course, you need to take into account also the paralactic angle corrections because you are tracking a source, typically the, during different hours. So you have an effect there that affects the phases that you are recording directly from the stations. 
And of course, the source during observations may change the elevations, which means that you also have some dependencies there, especially for different antennas that will have different elevations. Of course, uh, you're recording in general two polarizations. Ideally, those are orthogonal, so you have a signal in the right channel and the left channels, and they are completely independent. In practice, that's never true. You always have some leakage from one to the other from different telescopes. So you always have also some terms there that you need to correct for. And the main ones say, uh, as always, you have effects that alter the expected gain amplitudes and phases that you are recording in the telescopes. And this is the main purpose that is corrected by one passes and fringe fitting. So, but, then we have some instrumental effects. And as you saw during the plotting yesterday, you typically have a one pass shape that is not completely flat for the bump width that you are recording, but you have a, a different response in the instrument for different uh, like frequencies for uh, within the band. And this is something instrumental that needs to be corrected to recover the true amplitudes in the signal. And of course, at the end, you may have some errors that may be yeah, uh, dependent on the two antennas. So here I call them baseline base errors. So this is true in general for any interferometer. Then the particularities of VLBI is that you have antennas that are really far away from each other. So compared to connected interferometers, you typically have the, the stations in the same place, roughly. So that means that all the perturbations coming from the atmosphere are roughly the same for all your antennas. Also, the data streams from the two antennas goes directly to a correlator. So just knowing the path lights that they have the signal, you know at which time you need to combine or which delay you need to incorporate there. However, in VLBI, this is not true. The stations are really far apart, typically not connected or directly connected between them. And that means that you really need to keep track of the clock information, so the timestamps at the data that you're recording individually per station. And it's only once uh, you arrive at the correlator level where you synchronize the two data streams uh, to obtain the coherent uh, combination of the data. Additionally to that, you may expect completely different atmospheric conditions from one antenna to the other because you are separated thousands and thousands of kilometers. And another effect that you may have is that stations have proper motions. They move because they are in different earth tectonic plates in general. So that's why you really need to know uh, uh, the absolute position of the stations and also uh, keep those ones up to date. So all these things introduce different, if we focus on phases, different delays in the data that you're receiving and some perturbations with respect to the only geometrical model that you are taking into account in the correlator level. So you correct for the first term, which is uh, uh, the geometrical delays, as we mentioned before. Of course, you may not know completely perfectly the position of the station. So you may always have some small variations there, no offsets. Of course, the phases for different baselines may be affected by the fact that maybe your source is not strictly point-like and we're in the center of your phase center where you are correlating. So that also may introduce some phase. Uh, variations. And of course, the important parts and um, that they are time variable and you cannot predict is the propagation effects. So you the signal goes through the atmosphere and depending on your frequency, you may be more affected by the troposphere if you're observing at high frequencies or the ionosphere if you're observing at lower frequencies, like below five gigahertz. And of course, always you need to take into account that you have different instruments, so they may really introduce different instrumental effects, delays in your signal paths. 
plus your wish will have some signal. So all this means that if you observe a compact source, you will see an evolution of the phases and you have, you can see here the phases versus time for different baselines in one particular EVN observation. You will always see from the raw data that the phases evolve with time. Um, you expect at least a smooth evolution, so you can correct for it. This is what you do in the data reduction. And you also can notice that this evolution may be different for different baselines, especially for different uh, baseline lengths. So the difference in VLBI is that the evolution of these phases may be much faster than what you will expect in a really compact interferometer, in a connected interferometer. So the only way to properly correct for that is if you don't correct directly the phase evolution, but what you fix, you fix is actually the derivatives of the phases. So you correct for the delays, which is the evolution of the phases versus frequency, and the rates, how they evolve with time. And this is what we call fringe fitting. And I'm not going to go into the details here because you will have a dedicated uh, lecture after this one by Des about fringe fitting. So he will explain everything up to you. So one thing as you can see here is that you really need good signal to noise, of course, to be able to trace the evolution of the phases. That's why you always want to observe bright sources. Of course, your target in general will not be that bright or it can be resolved. So you may not have such much a signal there. And that's why in general, or for fine sources, you really need a second calibration source, uh, likely really nearby to the target. So the corrections that you're applying, you assume that they are exactly the same ones that the target could uh, require. Uh, also, in the cases that you really want to recover the absolute astrometry, the absolute position of your target, you also need some calibrator sources, at least to compare with the absolute positions in those ones. And of course, as you can derive from the previous slides, you may have some effects that are just instrumental, purely instrumental, or other ones that are uh, sky dependent, so position dependent, direction dependent, sorry, which are basically the ones related to the atmosphere conditions, so propagation effects. So in that case, you know that for different positions of the sky, the corrections will be different, and that's why if you use a phase calibrator, a calibrator source to correct for these uh, effects, you really need it to be really close to the target. So ideally within a few degrees, the closer it will be, the more similar corrections it will need compared to the target. But of course, not always you have a really bright calibrator close to the, your target sources. So, for at least to correct for those instrumental effects that do not depend on the direction that you are pointing to, you may prefer to observe what we call fringe finders of one pass calibrators that may be farther away, but they are typically brighter because you pick a much brighter source. So that allows you to correct for everything that is not direction dependent with a much higher signal to noise. So the corrections likely will be better. And if you're interested in polarization, of course, you always need to observe some source that provides a polarization information so you can correct for it. So a typical EVN observation or PLBI observation uh, can look like this. You typically observe at least a couple of times a fringe finder that typically will be your strongest source. So it will have the highest amplitudes. That means that for phases or other conditions, it will provide to you the higher signal to noise. But this source is quite far from the, your target. So that means that the solutions that you may find for the phases cannot be directly applied to the target. On the other hand, if you're observing a fine target, means that the amplitudes will be kind of consistent with the noise that you expect for those baselines. And you will not be able to recover the phase information because basically your signal is dominated by noise, not by the source signal. So that's why you observe the phase calibrator 
uh, in between your role, well, the opposite, uh, you serve the face calibrator and then the target in between. So at least you have a source to derive solutions, correct for the evolution of the faces, and then extrapolate those solutions to the target. So this is basically the general concepts that we will go during the data reaction. If we start with that, uh, as you already observed yesterday, we have two first steps before going through the fringe fitting. One is the practical angle corrections that is also related to which kind of mount type your antennas have, because you're observing on different with different orientations, the sky, so you need to correct for that. Otherwise, you will have a sinusoidal phase trend in your data. And Oh, this and the second one is the a priori gain calibration. So, what's the real Jansky flux level of your amplitudes recorded by the station? In Apes, all those two things were integrated in the data provided for the EVN, so you didn't need to care about those ones. In Casa, it's a bit different, just for the moment. So, for the paracti angle, you always need to keep in mind that you need to set the parang uh, flux equals true. So you are considering this effect. And then yesterday, Mark already mentioned how to apply the gain calibration from the thesis values that we provide with some external scripts for now in CASA. So let's focus on this gain calibration. Uh, probably several of you are coming from connected interferometers like PLA, Westerboard, ATCA, where you typically observe an amplitude calibrator during your observations. So this is a, typically a point like source with a really stable emission. So you don't see any variability at all. So you know the absolute uh, flux that this source should exhibit. So as you observe it in your observation, you just need to scale up the amplitudes that you're observing in your data to the correct or the expected amplitude for this source. And you apply the same correlation, the same correction for the other ones. So that's easy. That already gives you the absolute flux that you will expect, and it corrects all the amplitudes in all your sources. However, this is not possible in the LBI, mainly because two reasons. One is that uh, most of the sources on the LBI scales, they are resolved to some extent. So that means that the sources are not longer point-like sources, so you will not expect the same amplitude for all baselines. So in that case, either you have a really detailed model of your source at any given UV distance or orientation, or you cannot uh, just scale up or down your amplitudes. And the other um, thing is that if you find a source that is completely compact, even on VLBI scales to millisecond second level, then that source is likely to be highly variable because mostly they will be blazer if it's a <coughs> strong one and extragalactic. And that means that it will likely show a high variability. So that means that you don't have an absolute amplitude or you don't know the absolute flux to scale them out. So that's why uh, you cannot use an amplitude calibrator in VLBI data, but you need to rely on the system temperatures that you measure during the observation. So again, this is radio uh, antennas. Basically, typically you measure the powers in units of temperature. So it's what it will be equivalent from a black body emission. And basically the system temperatures are the power that you are measuring, assuming that you don't have any contribution from any source in the sky. So just the noise of the antenna. So of course, given these powers, you can always, or you purpose is to set a relation and conversion between power units, temperature units, and flux, real flux in the sky. So for that, you really need to know what's your sensitivity, okay, the absolute gain of your uh, antenna, which typically is called the DPFU, the degrees per flux units. So how much temperature you have, or it's converted to a flux unit. And basically what you do during the observation is incorporating or triggering an artificial signal and also setting it off. So by measuring the relative uh, intensities that you are measuring at the station, you can set 
or get an estimation of these conversions. So that's why you measure the system temperatures during the observation. And then you also have the gain curve because of course, the sensitivity of your antenna will depend on mainly the elevation that you're observing to. Lower elevations will have less sensitivity. So typically you disentangle those two values, you get an absolute gain for the antenna, and then you have a gain curve where you apply depending on the elevation of the source at each time. One important thing here is that this is just an estimation or your conversion between temperatures and power and flux, sorry. So in all VLBI observations, you need to keep in mind that this only gives you up to around 10% of precision in the measure fluxes, in the final measure fluxes from your sources. Okay. So uh, before going to just the rest of the calibration steps, I will make a reminder for some of you. And it's about Fourier transform. This is always nice and recommend to keep in mind because to understand what is coming now. So most of you, if you remember a delta function, uh, if you do the transform of that one, it's always a constant. That means in the 2D plane, let's say that the delta function is what you will expect from a really point-like source, is that you will expect the same amplitudes at any given UV point. So that means that for all your baselines, that will be different UV points, different UV distances, you will always have the same amplitude. But this is only true if the source is completely unresolved. If you have a resolved uh, source that can be here characterized as a Gaussian, for example, you know that for different UV distances, the flux will decay, also kind of a Gaussian-like. So for the short baselines, you will may expect a really high flux, but then that flux will decay for longer baselines, even going to zero if the source is completely resolved. Okay, so keep always in mind to understand everything in the calibration that a point like source will have some, uh, the same amplitudes for all baselines. But of course, if it's resolved, you will expect to see uh, lower amplitudes uh, and then uh, less reconstruct phases on the longest baselines because you will have sig uh, less signal to noise. So why I'm saying this? Because to explain all the uh, phase corrections or all the data reduction steps that we you typically conduct, I'm going to use a diagram where you basically see the amplitudes and the phases and how they evolve with frequency and time. Okay. So of course the basic calibration always assumes that you have a point like source and that means constant amplitudes for the baselines and you set relative phases so at the end you just set them to zero. And that should be always true at any given time during your observation and also at each frequency the ones that you're observing. So, <coughs> sorry. Now we will focus on the data calibration steps. Uh, based on this, this is what you will expect for a strong source on a particular baseline. So, both versus frequency and time, the amplitude should always be constant to a level, which is the flux of the source. And then you will always uh, expect phases around zero. Okay, you will always have some noise there, but around zero. So in reality, if you plot the raw data from any VLBA observation, what you see is something like this. Okay. So the amplitudes are not flat, but you see the band pass shapes. So meaning that you can distinguish the different subbands where your data were divided. And you see that the signal goes basically to zero at the edges of those subbands. In some particular cases, you may have a slightly different amplitude uh, dependent with the time. And in the phases, they are never flat. As you saw in the previous plot, you always have some trends, um, especially by time. And then in frequency, you typically have a slope, but also some jumps between subbands. Okay. Uh, and this is, of course, for a bright source where you can reconstruct 
quite well what's the amplitude and phases. If you observe a fine source, what happens always is that you're dominated by noise. So basically you cannot say anything about amplitudes. They are consistent with just the noise or zero. And the phases will be completely random because what you are recording is dominated by noise, not by actual signal from the source. So going back to the previous plot, this is why you always use a calibrator source if your studies are, so, are faint to calibrate the data. Then this one summarizes basically every step that you need to do to in data reduction. So we will go one by one and see you know, all the different steps that you do. So let's start with the phases versus frequency. This is not a step that is strictly necessary in all cases. We recommend in most of them, and you will see why in basically three slides in the future. But basically here, I mentioned that you have a slope in the phases and then some jumps between subbands. And those jumps are basically related with the instrumental effects that you have in your station. Uh, some of the subbands may record, well, may be recorded through, through a different hardware within the station. So that means that actually the path length is not exactly the same because different hardware may introduce a few small delays in the signal. And this is what you're seeing here. The instrumental delays just uh, originated by where within the antenna the data went through. So this means that these jumps are strictly instrumental. Doesn't, they are not affected by where in the sky you are pointing to and it will be completely constant in time, it will be the same. And that means that you can, you don't need to care about the time dependence on these ones and you only want a strong source, the strongest one, because then you can have a much better signal to noise and you can fix for them and correct for them. And this is what you, we call the instrumental delay correction. So again, these effects are not time dependent. So you only need to consider a small amount of data, enough to have a high signal to noise, but not long enough that you may have some other time effects that may alter the solutions. So we typically, you consider a couple of minutes, for example, in your fringe finder, because it's the stronger signal, and you get a solution for those ones. And the, goal is to correct just those jumps. And of course, uh, you don't want to correct for any time dependence that your data may have here, the raw data. So you set uh, zero rates, so you are not correcting for the rates. So the evolution of the phases versus time. So once you apply the instrumental delay, at that particular time, you will flood the phases and then you correct for these jumps. But if you look at the data at different time uh, stamps, you will still see a slope in the phases that will be different for different times because you are not correcting about the evolution of the phases. Here, you are only correcting about those jumps that you saw at the beginning. So the important part is that now all the phases are completely continuous across your band. So if we move to the amplitudes, versus frequency, you are quite probably familiar already with the bandpass shapes here, that this is an artificial shape that you introduce to split the band that you're recording, or where well, your telescope is not sensitive. And then this is an easy correction. This is the called bandpass calibration. You only want a strong source. Again, it's just an instrumental effect, doesn't depend with time. So you may only want to correct, uh, well, get one correction, for one of the sources in your observation and then apply the same correction for the whole observation because these shapes will be the same for all the sources and for all the times. <coughs> so uh, with the bandpass correction, as you may have seen in the plots yesterday, you will get, or you will end up with flat amplitudes across your band this is the ideal case. In a few particular cases, you may still see a small deviation from that one. So you may have flat amplitude, but it's slightly different. 
across your different subbands. Of course, this will only then be corrected by self-calibration once you have a better model of the resources, but these are typically small enough that they are not that relevant. And in the same way, if you do the amplitudes versus time, you may have in some particular cases, especially when you're observing sources with low elevations, that the amplitudes may be dropping slightly from what you would expect. And this is basically because, again, at the lower elevations, you may have less sensitivity and maybe the a priori gain calibration did not took everything into account there. But basically, you can only correct for this uh, during self-calibration. So once you have a full model of your source and you know the expected amplitudes. But then, uh, <coughs> sorry. We go to the main calibration step, which is the fringe fitting. And in this step, this is the only thing that is left up to now is the phases, the evolution of the phases along the time and also along the frequencies. And this is basically one of the most important parts that you have in the data reduction. So you see from the raw data that the phases will evolve quicker or slower across the time. And of course, if you remember, you will still have some slopes across your band. So the purpose here is that make all the phases flat. You really need to correct for all these uh, propagation effects that you had here and correct for the artificial evolution of the phases. This is what fringe fitting does. So it corrects for the delays and rates at once, doing just less square fitting. So you are correcting for the evolution of those phases. <coughs> and again, these are direction dependent. So you either soft them directly in the target if they are is bright enough, or you only can correct for them in a source that is nearby. So the phase calibrators needs to be just within a few degrees. So the perturbations are roughly the same for both sources. And here uh, you can do two things: the standard one or one of the ways is to produce, of course, a solution for a given solution interval that must be proportional to how fast the phases scale. So it allows you to have enough signal to noise, but also not uh, don't taking into account the fast variability that you see. And in terms of the frequencies, you may combine your whole bandwidth. So in that case, you are increasing the signal to noise. But in this case, of course, you need to guarantee that all the phases were continuous previously. So that was the motivation of the initial instrumental delay correction. On the other hand, you can just provide a solution per subband. So in that case, the instrumental delay is not necessary because in the global frame, you will correct for those jumps that you saw in the phases across the different subbands. However, if you get a solution per subband means that you are uh, getting a lower signal to noise because you're not combining the whole subband, the whole band. So that's why depending on how bright your calibrator is, you may prefer to conduct the instrumental delay correction and then a global fringe, or if you have enough signal to noise, you can do a global fringe and that's it. But in that case, you need to do it subband independent. And of course, all these corrections have been done in the calibrator. What you are interested in is in your target that again, in most of the cases may be faint enough. So that's why you observe the calibrator and then the target in between, because you will get solutions and phases for your calibrator. And then once you characterize the evolution of the phases and you correct for them, you will apply this correction for the target. At those times, you were dominated by noise. You don't see a trend in the phases, but then you hope it's uh, almost always the case. The corrections that you apply in the calibrator right before and between, it will be continuous. So the same corrections applies to the target. So that's the path to- Five minutes, Benito. Yeah, thanks. So that's the path to 
move from the raw data and calibrated uh, information that you have looks like the blue lines to a fully calibrated data set as the green one. <coughs> so, of course, once you're done with the data reaction, you're interested only in the targets, you don't care about the calibrators, you need to apply two solutions to the and transfer them to the target source. And then you focus on the imaging. So you image your source and then in some cases, if you are looking enough, especially for current calibrators, you may self-calibrate to improve this calibration. I will not focus now in details in any of those ones because you have a dedicated lecture on imaging and then you also have a dedicated lecture on self-calibration. But before ending, I would like to do two remarks in the two uh, steps. One is imaging and basically important differences with respect to connected interferometers. Because <coughs> if you come from analyzing VLA data, for example, or any connected interferometer, there are a few small details that you need to keep in mind when analyzing VLBI data. First, the UE plane is less, the field, less full than in connected interferometers, or typically it is. So that means that you have larger gaps. So it's poorer covered in this kind of observations. And that means that the noise that you will expect in the images deviate from the typical Gaussian behavior. So you don't have a Gaussian noise. And that means that actually across your field, you will likely have a stronger spikes as you expect from a Gaussian distribution. And that means that if you don't know a priori the a priori position of your target, you typically need to set a level of high sigma, typically, to claim a detection. Because across your field, you may have spikes that look at a five, almost six sigma level, and they are not real. The other one is that uh, also related to how you cover the, you reconstruct the UV plane but also the amplitude measurements there is like you need to measure flux densities a bit more carefully than connected interferometers. And also you always have different ways to measure flux densities. So traditional one is through the image plane, you have already an image. So you measure fluxes there either with boxes, fitting options. And that's in the image plane. So you are not uh, taking out the the contraction of your synthesized beam or how the a point lag source would look into the your sky map and that means that a the fluxes that you get there may be slightly different or have subtle difference than if you measure the fluxes just by fitting your uv data but that's also possible and sometimes can provide to you a bit more reliable fluxes and of course given that this is an interferometer, you are not obtaining a UV point across the whole UV plane, UV point, sorry, across the plane, uh, you are missing several special scales. So that means that you only have some uh, different scale uh, information. And that provides that if you have large gaps in you, for example, UV distance, they may be different source shapes that provide exactly the same information that you are seeing. For example, in this case, if you have only short best lines are really long ones, but you are missing the information in between, you will have exactly the same response for a completely point-like source or a ring source, okay? So you need always to keep in mind that depending on which gaps you have in your UV plane, you may be missing some special structures. And the last one is about self-calibration. Uh, you will have a lecture dedicated to that, so you will have more feedback there. But always keep in mind that self-calibration may basically modifies your actual data to fit your model, your source model. So that means that if your model is not completely accurate, you will introduce some artificial deviations in your data. 
Okay, so that's why you always need to be careful and be confident in what you are doing there, because it's easily, especially in amplitude, to scale up and down artificially what you're observing. And then in your target, you will end up with completely wrong amplitudes or even shapes. So just to finish, you have a summary and also from other lectures about all the steps. And as you saw here, it's always also relevant uh, to how you conduct the observations on which kind of sources you are observing. So the first step to produce a better data reduction is always to have a good scheduling that fits the purpose that you want to achieve in your observation. So don't forget that scheduling is also an important part and you also have some feedback about what to what you should schedule and what properties those calibrator sources should achieve to be able to obtain a good data reduction. So that's it. Okay. Thanks, Benito. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, it seems like some people have lost some audio. So as Ilse has put in the chat, please go to the YouTube stream, which seems to be okay. Anyway, we were okay, but it seems some people were losing it. Um, so I'll pass over to Mark, who should be able to uh, summarize some of the questions we've been having through Matamos and the uh, Q&A. So Mark, wherever you're ready, you yep. can grill Benito. <laughs> so the, the first question nicely ties into the last comment that, uh, that Benito made. Um, so the question is, during VLBI observations, how long are the target scans supposed to be? Uh, is there a, a, a rule of thumb to, uh, to, to reobserve? Well, the question says phase scale, but uh, uh, reobserve a calibrator, I suppose, after a, a particular amount of time. Yeah, it's a good question, actually. So. Of course, you cannot always provide an absolute value that is the one that you should observe. The thing is that uh, you want as long as possible your scans on the target because that will mean that you are getting more data, of course, in your target. But on the other hand, you still want to recover the solutions if you are doing face referencing from your face calibrator, for example. And then you need to keep in mind that you really need to have a good extrapolation of the solution from the calibrator to the target. So basically the limitation is how the phases evolve with time. So you, the solutions that you obtain for the calibrators will nicely interpolate the ones for the target. That's of course depends on elevations and baselines, but for a typical VLBA observation, mm, the only factor that you may keep in mind at the beginning is just the frequency that you're observing. The higher frequencies, the faster the atmosphere effects evolve. So as reference, let's say that at five gigahertz, we typically set cycles of around five minutes, meaning that you may spend like three minutes and a half uh, on your target and then one minute, one minute and a half on your calibrator. Okay, in the calibrator you only need as much time as provides to you a good signal to noise. So it depends basically on how bright is that calibrator. Typically between one, two minutes is enough for a bright source. And then around, yeah, three, four minutes on the target. So a full cycle of five minutes. If you go to lower frequencies, one gigahertz or so, you may go longer. So on the, long, on the scale of six, seven minutes, for example, for the whole cycle. And if you go up to 20 gigahertz, so higher frequencies, you may need to spend basically one minute target, one minute calibrator, because otherwise you will not get good solutions for the target. So we are talking about basically those levels there. Mm. Yeah, of course, if you want better solutions for astrometry and everything, and you really want the best uh, possible solutions, and you don't care that much about the signal to noise on your target, you may reduce the cycles, or the opposite. If you don't care that much about how the solutions, because the target will be bright enough to self-calibrate later, then you may be, go a bit longer. But let's say at five gigahertz is always recommended of the order of a five minute 
cycle. So considering phase calibrator and target time. Thank you, Benito. Um, then we have a question on Mattermost. Um, how important is it to have the fringe calibrator at the start of the observation and at the end of the observation? It's not necessarily. The thing, for example, for the EVN, we always recommend to have at least two different scans on the fringe finders. And um, this is, in principle, not needed. With one, you have enough, and then you don't care where you place it. The problem is that during an observation, and depending on how long it lasts, but let's say a standard, on average, eight hour observation, you may have stations that drop or they couldn't observe that source, or you have other effects, so you miss the data in those scans. So for the fringe finder, you really want to have information from all the stations. So that's why if you always schedule two scans, uh, as far apart as possible, uh, kind of you have uh, good chances of getting all data from all the stations when you were working properly. So this is just basically to avoid missing information from one station at the scan where the fringe finder was observed. So sometimes we schedule just at the beginning and at the end, because then the chances that if something happened at the beginning of the observation, at the end, everything was solved and everything was working or the opposite. But it's not strictly necessary to schedule right at the beginning or right at the end. And of course, depending on the sources that you're serving, you may prefer to have it right in the middle and then another any time. The only, I will say that yeah, the only issue is if you want to reconstruct like geoblocks or polarization calibrations, reconstruct the correct for the D terms or so, where you really need to have different scans on the fringe finder or polarization calibration. So in that case, you really need different times and basically covering the whole observation. But for a fringe finder purposes, it doesn't matter where you schedule them. And we recommend at least two scans if the observation is long, just to avoid possible missing data from a telescope. Okay. Um, next question is, um, why did you leave out the K matrix from the so the delay term in the measurement equation you showed? Oh. Okay. For any no reason at all. Well, I think I think yeah. I know the answer of that. What you 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 copied the the what's in the in the CASA manual for it, that. Yeah, exactly. What, I took basically the reference that CASA was using. So basically, that doesn't really isn't specifically targeted to VLBI, and of course, some of the delay is actually in the in the tropospheric delay that you're correct. Yes. Yeah. So basically, that's the standard form that CASA is written, but yeah, the focus also in the details there. But yeah. in general, yeah, the delays that you have, you can fit them in the other terms inside, depends on how you account for them at the end. Um, so we have a couple of more questions in the Q&A. Um, so why do we see those, those spy up to six sigma spikes in the image field? Can you explain that again? Oh. Yes, so let's just start with the more natural one that comes typically when you have a connected interferometer with a lot of antennas, let's say the VLA, okay? In that case, you are observing a field, you do the image, and there typically the noise is just Gaussian, okay? So it follows a Gaussian distribution. And in that case, you know that, okay, a uh, three sigma spike will have 99.99 per se probability. Uh, <coughs> but that assumes that your noise is Gaussian. And this is only true when you are recovering or filling the UV plane kind of accurately. VLBI observations 
you may have a lower number of antennas, but maybe even you have a larger number of antennas, but they are more spread away. So the empty gaps in the UV plane are much larger. So in a typical uh, even observation, you may even have a hole between the short and the long baselines sometimes. And that means that when you are reconstructing the image, the sky image, that noise is not Gaussian anymore. The, basically the tails on the lower and the high levels are higher than expected from a Gaussian distribution. So that means that you have a higher probability of getting just by noise uh, stronger sp uh, spikes than what you would expect from the Gaussian distribution. So basically at the end, that's the only reason. Uh, in a field, uh, let's say when you do your field of uh, one second or any given uh, field, then you have a higher probability of, ha of having stronger spikes there. So basically the six sigma cutoff, as I mentioned there for any random position in your field is kind of equivalent to a three sigma probability for a Gaussian distribution. So anything above six sigma there in the field, you can be sure that it's likely to be a real signal from my source and not just noise. But basically it's just because with the purely field UV plane, you have a higher probability of having stronger spikes than if you compare with a Gaussian distribution. Thank you. And then oh, the, last one. the last question. Sorry about that's okay. Yep. Um, the last, there's a, there's still one question more. So I think we still have a, a minute for that because I think it is a, a short question. Could you mention uh, something about the choice of the reference antenna? Oh yeah, that's a good one actually. Yes, so in data reduction, you always said relative differences for everything. So you always keep one antenna as reference and then you just correct everything else relative to that one or all the baselines to that antenna. So for that, you really need to know that that antenna is behaving as good as possible and likely observing all the time. <coughs> so at least in that case, what you want is typically the antenna that provides to you the best signal to noise, because that means that for all the best lines, you will also get the highest signal to noise. And then an antenna that didn't have any problem or observed during the whole observation. Okay, so in the case of the AVN, most of the times is simple. FSBR is typically the most sensitive antenna that you have, it's quite reliable. So it's the one that you typically check a use as reference antenna by default. That's in an homogeneous array where you have an antenna that is uh, significantly more sensitive than the others. Of course, if this antenna didn't observe for most of your observation, you may prefer another one. Also in CASA, you may have a solution for that reference antenna. And if that one is not available, it will change to another one. But then it's a bit trickier because you really need to be careful, especially for astrometry purposes, if you really need really good astrometry, because the changes between one reference and the other may introduce some offsets at those particular times. So the general rule is like, pick always the one that observed during the whole observation and is the most sensitive one. So for that one, you will get the best solutions possible for your observation. And yeah, I think that's kind of the summary there. If you want any more details about those ones, just yeah, do follow up questions here or in matter most. Okay, so um, Mark, if you could put the last question into the Matamos channel, then Benito, you can answer this in your own time. Thanks again, Benito, for the nice talk, and thanks for the help, Mark, with the questions. Um, and you've got some nice uh, congratulations in the, the chat as well for you, Benito. Thanks. Uh, so, 
Next up, we've got Des, um, and Des is going to talk about the latest VLBI tasks in CASA. Um, so whenever you are ready, Des, then please take it away. I'll give you a five minute warning if that's okay. Um, and yeah, start whenever you're ready.